If you go on Wolfram Alpha right now, you can do this in your web browser, as I often do for this show. I do almost all of my calculations on Wolfram Alpha. You can search for an interesting distribution, and that is your names. Distribution, at least within the United States, is the data that they're using. So if you type in, as you're seeing now, on screen somewhere. Uh, if you type in age distribution of the name and then insert your name, you can come up with, like you're seeing here, I did this for Bob, you can see the percentage in terms of what aged person is of that name and how frequent is that name in the United States population. So for Bob, you see something interesting in that almost no one from the ages of zero to 30 is named Bob and the average age is 51 and uh, there's about 64,000 people named Bob estimated to live in the US right now. And if you look at the distribution, you see that Bob is an older name. You don't meet many young people named Bob, but if you type in something like my name, Kyle, you find exactly the opposite, where it's much more prevalent, about half a million people share my name, and the average age is around 20, and almost no one, 0% of people over the age of 60, are named Kyle. So it's a much younger name, comparatively. And you can do this for your own name, you can post it in the comments, and uh, it just says, yeah, expected number of people alive today with the name Kyle, 446,831. <laughs> it's kind of a big number. But, uh, yeah, I need 446,830 laser bees. Yeah, target the name Kyle. Yeah, kind of indiscriminately, like Terminator 1, where he was trying to find Sarah Connor, so he looked in the phone book and he took out all the Sarah Connors. Yeah, just do that for Kyle. Get it done. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was just falling for an essential oil pyramid scheme? Get out of here, my friend's mom. We don't want part of your MLM bull. Welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections, and then I distribute them in a graph of percentages in terms of what's good and what's bad, and I select according to goodness, not your names. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint. Ooh. But getting right down to it, in the last episode of Because Science, we are outlining a way that we might be able to make interstellar travel a lot more plausible. We were talking about neutron star slingshots, which use the physics of gravity assists to fling spacecraft potentially at very high percentages of light speed to get humans beyond our own solar system. This was an idea first thought up by legendary physicist Freeman Dyson, and we outlined the whole thing and its plausibility, and you can watch the full episode back on YouTube if you haven't yet. What I want to know though is, okay, what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from Philip Collier, who says, love the show, Kyle. Ah! The main problem I see with the neutron star slingshot is by the time we had all the technology involved to make it work, we wouldn't need to even attempt it. Super materials to keep the ship intact, biotechnology to protect the passengers, cold fusion at the very least. By the time you got all this together, you would already have cheap energy, functional immortality, and ships that could probably accelerate to some percentage of the speed of light in about a year with only one G of thrust, adding two years to the 470 years travel time versus the almost instantaneous acceleration the gravity assist. <laughs> What's important to point out about analyses like this is that they're kind of in the vacuum <laughs> of space. Freeman Dyson wasn't thinking of all of the technological challenges that would come along with this. He was basically just doing the math using stars and using the variables that come along with those stars and then saying, well, if all of this were possible, then you might be able to do something like this. So you are kind of even going a step beyond what Freeman Dyson was doing and sketching out all the implications, everything that we would need to make work to make this actually feasible, something that we could really do in the near future. And I think you're right. By the time we could either create our own neutron star or create an interstellar system of waypoints where we can fling ourselves to the next destination, I think we'd probably already have generation ships and weird, cool fusion energy stuff. This could be incorporated into our plans. It doesn't have to be the main plan because as you said, yes, you know, we might be able to put ourselves in stasis by that point and then it makes all of this moot. Our next comment comes from Science Foundation and Invader who say, wouldn't it take a long time to get to the neutron stars in the first place? Well, we said that to use a neutron star slingshot to make the gravity assist work, you'd either want to find a pair of binary 
orbiting each other, neutron stars, or you would want to put your own in that orientation. And this would require hyper advanced technology, as a previous commenter was pointing out. And what Freeman Dyson was, I think, imagining was manipulating space in such a way that you either create neutron stars or you bring them to you and then you put them in this orientation. You're right to find neutron stars that are like this on their own and also close to us sounds extremely unlikely because we know they're not in our solar system and we can't really travel outside of our solar system right now anyway. So just getting to these binaries, these white dwarf or neutron star binaries would necessarily take probably as much time as it would take to get to the next thing anyway. Our next comment comes from Beethoven himself, Archangel Exile, Hoos, who say, well, wouldn't the acceleration of a neutron star slingshot just kind of turn everyone into people salsa? Well, if you think about it, if you were to go from some basically negligible speed, relatively speaking, to like a quarter the speed of light in some short amount of time, that would probably turn your body into paste. And I think all of your heads are in the right place. However, Freeman Dyson did think of this kind of acceleration. So I will go back to the, wait, you know what? I think we can just move right along to the super nerd comment because they say what I'm about to say. As soon as you mention a gravity assist from a white dwarf, the most obvious problem that popped into my mind, says Alexei, well, wouldn't you get liquefied from all the Gs? However, in his paper, Gravitational Machines, Freeman Dyson has actually calculated that delicate and fragile objects, AKA people, could survive uh, 10,000 G by traveling in a large enough spaceship, 80 meters in diameter. So yes, Alexei points out that if you go to the original paper, Freeman Dyson actually considers the acceleration. So I'm quoting here from the original paper, a white dwarf star binary with, the, with these parameters would have the interesting property that it would accelerate delicate and fragile objects to a velocity and acceleration of 10,000 G without doing any damage to the objects and without expending any rocket propellant. The only internal forces acting on the accelerated objects would be the tidal stresses. And he goes on to calculate that this wouldn't be that much if you had a spacecraft with a diameter of 80 meters. So a large spaceship with human passengers, I'm still quoting, and normal mechanical construction, normal mechanical construction could easily survive the acceleration. It may be imagined that a highly developed technological species might use white dwarf binaries scattered around the galaxy as relay stations for heavy long distance freight transportation. So I know it kind of gets your science sense a tingling when you say that kind of acceleration but Freeman actually did the math. And so if you have a big enough spaceship, I will admit I'm not understanding exactly where he's coming from with everything, but he's a lot smarter than me. If you have a large enough spaceship, the only accelerations you would be getting are from the tidal forces of the stars themselves. And it wouldn't be all that much if you constructed the stars correctly and then you'd be fine. But you know why, Alexei? Do you know why you're a super nerd this week? Because instead of just taking my word for it, you went to the original paper, you found it yourself, you read it yourself, and I appreciate that kind of dedication because that's what it takes to become, yes, a super nerd. Yeah! But of course, I'm not always right. I called a spoon a tiny mouth shovel earlier. What is a cup if not just a tall bowl? So what did I get wrong last week? Well, our first correction comes from Umbrasitor, who says velocity thief equals Velociraptor. There goes the starship Velociraptor slashing through the cosmos. Dang, that sounds cool. So a couple of you said that when I called my ship the Velocity Thief, you could just call it the Velociraptor because the origins of the word Velociraptor have something to do with thief. And if you look it up as I did, in Latin, Velociraptor means swift Caesar, kind of like velocity thief, or like thieving something with velocity, I suppose. So, I hereby declare, Umbrasator, my official spaceship will bear your name. It will be the Velociraptor, swiftly switching through the cosmos. It's canon. And it has cannons. <laughs> At least two. <laughs> Jake Newland Griffin says, why isn't this a because space episode? Dr. Moo needs more love on this channel. Oh, trust me, if anyone loves Dr. Moo, it's me. I know, I know, trust me. I know that Dr. Moo needs to be featured more on this channel. I love her too. 
I love all, everything that she does. She's a incredibly talented, smart lady. And the only reason why this wasn't a Because Space episode is because Dr. Moo has a fancy full-time job, literally protecting other planets from microorganisms. So we have to work around her schedule. She can't do everything, obviously, this is my full-time job, so we have to work around her schedule, and there will be more Because Space in the future. That's a promise fact. Our next correction comes from Eric Moore, Metro Viper, Victor Hugo, uh, Jay, and they all say, I have one question. How are you going to stop? If you're going to be accelerated to some ridiculous velocity by the neutron star slingshot, you still have to slow down from a quarter of light speed. How are you going to do that? Well, like our super nerd comment, Austin K has an idea with how to solve this problem. But Kyle, if you wanted more than a blurry snapshot of Proxima Centauri B, you would need to slow down considerably. That would require another system of orbiting neutron stars relatively close to your destination or some sci-fi futuristic propulsion system which would make the need for the initial pair of neutron stars irrelevant. But I like your idea and many of you were pointing out the connection to the Mass Effect video games and the Mass Effect relays and what Austin K is getting at is something I'm imagining like this. You do have to slow down considerably but you could use neutron stars and this uh, kind of acceleration in reverse, right? For deceleration if it's not going to kill you as Freeman Dyson points out with his calculations, then you can imagine, say, a neutron star binary inside of our solar system and then inside of another solar system that you were trying to get to. You would accelerate to that extreme velocity inside of ours, you would travel to the next one, and when you got there, you would basically gravitationally assist in reverse by going around the stars in a different direction and slow way down. Give away all of your velocity, be a velocity donator instead of velocity thief, and you would slow back down to the regular interplanetary speed and that might be some kind of relay system inside of other solar systems across the galaxy using these white dwarf or neutron star binaries and that might work, maybe. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this video, I'm giving to the Science Asylum who says, Hey Kyle, this might be nitpicky, but as someone who did their master's thesis on white dwarf stars, I just can't let it go. First of all, I love that legitimately intelligent people such as you comment on these videos. Uh, at 905, you use one solar mass in your calculation for a neutron star, when a minimum mass for a neutron star, as you know, is a limit of point uh, 1.4 solar masses, anything less, and then it is a white dwarf. Also, a radius of 20 kilometers is a little big. Uh, it would have a diameter of 20 kilometers and a radius of 10. I think you actually made the same problem with the white dwarf stars. As the neutron star gains mass, its diameter will actually shrink, so a radius of 10 kilometers is the maximum for a neutron star. If you found some way to compress matter into a neutron star with smaller mass and you're not sharing it with the world, this just confirms your supervillain status. I'm not a supervillain, I just made a mistake. So this is a big mistake for this episode and I will go back and reflect that in the comments on YouTube. But as you point out, 20 kilometers, that seems a little big for the radius of a neutron star and 20,000 kilometers for a radius of a white dwarf star also sounds way big. Do you know why? It's because I misread the original paper. So in the equation for calculating the orbital velocity of these stars, I use the radius, the R value, as the radius of the stars themselves, when in actuality, they're the radius of the orbit. So not the star size themselves, but how far away from the center point the stars are orbiting. So this part is the 20 or 20,000 kilometers, not the stars themselves. You put it into the same equation, and so you get the same uh, numbers. You get the correct numbers for the gravitational assist velocity. That's correct, but I may have misled you in thinking that the stars were so big when in fact we're talking about the orbital radius. So this was my bad. I misread the paper. The numbers are still all correct but I did not portray them in the correct way. So for pointing that out and for getting a master's degree involving white dwarf stars and for correcting me, which I needed correcting on, you are indeed the science asylum, a super nerd. Good luck on your PhD if you're doing it. Now, moving right along to this week's episode of Because Science. This week's episode is sharks with frickin' laser beams attached to their heads. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are taking yet another supervillain trope and we are exploring it. If you were to get sharks and put frickin' laser beams onto their heads, what kind of laser beam would you use? How would the sharks use it? What kind of range would the lasers have? We're exploring all of this for totally not evil reasons. 
But before we get to sharks with laser beams attached to their heads, I can't believe we're finally doing that. Please go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, all about neutron star slingshots and leave me your best nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on the Instagram and the Twitter. And if you celebrate this week when you're watching uh, this video when it originally comes out, have a wonderful Thanksgiving if you celebrate and do not forget if you can and you have the opportunity you should call your mom i know she would love to hear from you yeah yeah what's the update on the bees no 464 446000 yeah we need to eliminate all the other kyles yeah <laughs> yeah no i'd love some macaroni with some cut up hot dogs thanks mom i love you Call your mom.